here, and uh, I promised him a book, and um, I'm not seeing him this morning. Um, This is what we're looking at right now, and the answers are filled in up to the place where we are, approximately. So, and for anybody, a reminder, um, I have answer keys. It looks like they're uh, still there on the back tables. If you miss something, uh, you can uh, check there and fill it in. We're looking at... Um, what has um, become primarily a defense of the King James Bible. Um, it came about by way of review uh, uh, for guys who were coming into our transition program a few years ago from jail and so forth, and uh, they were exposed to every wind and doctrine in jail. Uh, their ideas of the Bible were um, strange and and distorted because of uh, all that they were exposed to. And uh, so we started, um, we, we developed this and, and put it together so that we'd have a foundation to work from. And uh, it's, I, I've heard a lot of positive feedback in here. We've looked at um, the first section, which was orientation to the scriptures, how the Bible's laid out, and what, what, what's going on there. Then we started, <coughs> Bibliology, or the doctrine of the scriptures. Um, and uh, we got through a, um, a good overview of all the parts except for preservation, which really is a kind of a subset to, to um, the bibliology section, but it, it's, it's an underappreciated aspect, and so we, we gave it a separate part. And the largest part. Um, most people who uh, claim any sort of, of uh, Christianity, um, name the name of Christ, um, uh, will agree with things like the inspiration, at least of the originals, uh, in, as far as the documents used to um, produce the Bible. But the, the necessity for the preservation of, of those scriptures and, and the very words that they contained is not widely recognized. We use the illustration, if somebody were to write you a check for a large amount of money, name your, name your figure, a thousand, a million, whatever, and you were on your way to the bank to deposit it or cash it, but a gust of wind jerked it out of your hand and it was gone, uh, would you have any, any business with the bank? No, it's gone. The preservation of the scriptures is critical. We wouldn't have them if, they, if God had not supernaturally superintended uh, their preservation. We have a promise that he would do so in Psalm 12, 6, and 7. Um, it's the, the um, key verses that we use to launch this section. It's in your, in your booklet. Psalm 12, 6, and 7 says, that the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them. What's them? The words. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Uh, I'm glad for that promise. Now, each, each um, Sunday as we've gotten started, we have reviewed the books of the Bible that we have introduced up to that point, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we had gotten through the Old Testament last time, and uh, we, we're going to need a week or two reviewing those because that's the biggest chunk, and it includes the minor prophets, which if there's a part that gives people trouble, that's usually it. Now, really participate this morning. If you have to look at your list there toward the front of your booklet, that's okay. But participate, read, but, but, but speak also. And as you hear these things orally, it'll, it'll have an extra impact on your thinking. And eventually you'll hear them correctly 
in your mind. So let's try it, okay? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. I can make a fool of myself it'll help, if it'll help you learn them. Um, I'm not as straight-laced as I'm alleged to be. Let's try it one more time. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Okay, I'm hearing some pretty good participation, and uh, for your sake, I'm glad of it. Now, before I go any further, I'm about to make a mistake, or was about to make a mistake, I've made too many times already. Is there anybody here for the very first time in this series, other than uh, Brother Walker. Anybody for the very, I'm sorry. I, you know. Lily. Who, who's that? Lily. Okay. Um, could you pass that over to her, please? Thank you. Bo, is this your first time? Okay. You're a familiar face, and I forgot there was a, a gap there. You're quite welcome. Is there anybody else? Okay. All right, last time we left off on page 40. Uh, so if you want to find page 40 in your books, is that correct? Everybody have that? Okay. Um, Actually, let's get a little bit of a running start here. Yeah, okay. There we go. We're looking at uh, um, the corrupt manuscripts here uh, from which all of the other versions other than the King James Bible is t are taken from. Um, and uh, both manuscripts contain the Apocrypha as part of the Old Testament. And you have in your um, notes there a little uh, statement about what, what the Apocrypha is. Now you'll hear some people argue, well, the King James, the 1611 edition of the King James had the Apocrypha also. It did, but not as scripture. It was just uh, contained uh, for historical context. Um, Tischendorf, we looked at him earlier, he actually got to look at some of these manuscripts, or, or these two, and uh, said that uh, they may have been written by the same man, possibly Eusebius. Uh, Vaticanus, that's one of the two, was available to the King James translators, but God gave them sense enough to ignore it. Vaticanus, um, omits Genesis 1, 1 through, 40, or, yeah, 1 through 46, uh, 28, and Psalm 106 through 138, Matthew 16, 2 and 3, Romans 6, 24, 1 Timothy through Titus, the entire book of Revelation, and it conveniently ends the book of Hebrews at 9, 14. There's a lot missing after that point in Hebrews. Um, I'm going to... Uh. 
while adding the epistle of Barnabas and the shepherd of Ermus to the New Testament, Sinaiticus, which is the other of the two main uh, corrupt manuscripts, omits John 5, 4 and 8, 1 through 11, Matthew 16, 2 and 3, Romans 16, 24, Mark 16, 9 to 20, Acts 8, 37, and 1 John 5, 7, just to name a few. Now, I took that away quickly because we've already gone at, over it, and you should have that in your notes. Even the ones who just got their books today, I believe those blanks will be filled in. So, um, now, we're going to be getting into new stuff today, and so I'll be going a little more slowly. It is believed that Sinaiticus has been altered by as many as ten different men. Consequently, it is a very sloppy piece of work which is probably the reason for it being in a trash can. That's where it was found. The Dutch scholar Erasmus, who produced the world's first printed Greek New Testament, rejected the readings of Vat Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. He's an underappreciated fella. Uh, sometime come, come for a tour upstairs. We've got a little, little uh, plaque on the wall uh, r regarding him that you'll find interesting. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus not only disagree with the majority text from which the KJV came, they also differ from each other over 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. Now what is it that God promised to preserve? His words. Okay, and as pastor so wonderfully reminds us from time to time, things that are different are what? Not the same. You say, well, anybody knows that. Well, think about it. When you, when you think about the, the, um, the words of Scripture, if it reads differently, at least one of them has to be wrong. The claim that B and Aleph, that's, that's another designation for the same two, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, are the oldest available manuscripts is not true. There are many Syriac and Latin translations from as far back as the second century that agree with the King James readings. For instance, the Peshitta, um, the date given, and the old Syriac both contain strong support for the King James readings. There are about 50 extant, meaning still existing, copies of the old Latin uh, from about 157 AD, which is over 200 years before Jerome was conveniently chosen by Rome uh, to revise it. The Ulfilis produced a Gothic a uh, version from Europe in AD 330, the Armenian Bible, which agrees with the King James, has over 1,200 extant copies and was translated by Mesrob around the year 400. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are clearly not the oldest and best. Now, even, even when, when, if we're talking about Greek and Hebrew, um, even if... Um, If we're talking about the age of available manuscript copies uh, from those languages, oldest and best uh, don't necessarily go together. Now, it sounds logical that the oldest would be closer to the original and therefore uh, have a better chance of being more accurate. And uh, we need to review this. We've got some new people, and, and it's been a while since we've talked about it. My dad and I... <coughs> Uh, we're not close. He wasn't a bad person. He didn't abuse me. Nothing. Like, we just weren't close. But he said a few things um, that I have found very practical. I don't know if they were original. He didn't claim they were. He didn't say they weren't. But one of, one thing that he said that that has stuck with me was a definition for for an antique. He said an antique is something that's been useless for so long, it's still in good shape. Think about that. If you don't use something, it doesn't wear out and it lasts. Now, for those of you who love antiques, and my wife is included in that, uh, no offense. Uh, but see, if you use something, such as the original manuscripts and the early copies made from the original manuscripts, they wear out. They have to be copied and recopied and so forth. And so, of course, the available copies are newer, 
than those that were rejected and never touched. And especially over there in the Middle East where the climate's so dry, they're gonna last, they don't deteriorate, there's not the humidity and so forth. So don't get suckered into this idea of oldest is necessarily best. They're not synonymous or, 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 or they don't fit together. Then There's terms for that, but they escape me just now. <coughs> Facts about Westcott and Hort. Now, um, Westcott and Hort developed the primary text from which most of these other so-called versions come. And uh, so let's, let's compare these fellas with the guys who developed the majority text. <coughs> By the way, when we say majority text, we're talking about the text that 95% uh, that, uh, of, ori of original language manuscript copies agree with, okay? Um, uh, these fellas developed the minority text, the text that uh, is supported by about 5% of available original manuscript copies, but which everybody flocks to because it's um, the intellectually elite thing to do. They can't really believe that, but but they get blackballed if they, if they buck it. So, uh, Brooke Foss Westcott and uh, Fenton John Anthony Hort were two English scholars who produced the corrupt Greek text of the modern perversions. Their dominating influence on the revision committee of 1871 to 1881 accounts for most of the corruption that we have today in modern translations. <coughs> Excuse me, I didn't mean to cough in your ear. Um, the Bible believers should keep several points in mind when discussing these two men. The following information is well documented in Final Authority by William Grady and in Ripplinger's New Age Bible versions. Now, Ripplinger uh, has a number of books out, one of which is about the size of a Strong's Concordance on this issue. Uh, it's a lot of reading, but it, it, it supplies incredible documentation. It's an eye-opener. Uh, together, the life and letters of Brooke Foss Westcott and the life and letters of Fenton John Anthony Hort run over 1,800 pages. Do I need to pause here? Are there any blanks that you have not been able to fill in? Okay, do flag me down. I have an advantage. My blanks are already filled in. Uh, let's back up and catch the last few words of this one so that we have a... Okay. Um, a personal salvation testimony is not given once for either man, and the name Jesus is found only nine times in 1,800 pages. Westcott was a firm believer in Mary worship, and Hort claimed that Mary worship had a lot in common with Jesus worship. Hort believed in keeping Roman Catholic sacraments. Now, uh, for those who might be not real clear on that term, a sacrament is something that a person does believing that it somehow improves their standing before God. <coughs> mm. um, it's uh, a part of works salvation, in other words. Hort believed in baptismal regeneration as taught in the Catholic Church. Hort rejected the infallibility of Scripture. That says a lot right there. Hort took great interest in the works of Charles Darwin, while both he and Westcott rejected a literal account of creation. Now, there are some fellows in, in uh, the history of, of um, Protestantism, of even uh, Baptists, who thought they had to accommodate so-called science and tried to explain creation in other terms in order to, to uh, seem intellectual and to account for so-called findings of science that seemed to 
um, or well, that actually declared that uh, creation wasn't a six-day event, it was millions and so forth of years. Um, but in recent times, there have been individuals who have seen the problem with that approach and have undertaken an, their entire ministry uh, to demonstrate that the, the Bible account of a six-day literal creation is absolutely supported by unbiased evidence. Uh, had to throw that in there. Westcott did not believe in the second coming of Christ, the millennium, or a literal heaven. What did he have to look forward to? Both men rejected the doctrine of a literal hell and they supported prayers for the dead in purgatory. Yeah, yeah. Hort refused to believe in the Trinity. So, which one of the Trinity was really God? And probably, probably their view of Jesus was was inadequate. Hort refused to believe in angels. Westcott confessed that he was a communist by nature. Westcott also did his share of beer drinking. In fact, only 12 years after the revised version was published, Westcott was a spokesman for a brewery. <coughs> I hope this doesn't overtake me before we finish. While working on their Greek text and while working on the revision committee for the revised version, Westcott and we're talking about the first of the so-called versions uh, that came out um, in an attempt to displace the King James. Westcott and Hort were also keeping company with seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now I went through some of those blanks quickly. I'll pause there in case you need a chance to catch up. Or I'll back up if need be. How are we doing? Shall I go to the next page? Okay. Both men took great interest in occult practices and clubs. They started the Hermes Club in 1845, the Ghostly Guild in 1851, and Hort joined a secret club called the Apostles in the same year. They also started the Iranus Club in 1872. These were spiritualist groups which believed in such unscriptural practices as communicating with the dead. Um, necromancy. The Westcott and Hort Greek, Hort Greek text was secretly, and that's an important thing to remember, was secretly given to the revision committee responsible for the so-called revised version of 1881, which was unethically based on a different Greek text. The members of the Revision Committee of 1881 were sworn to, sworn to a pledge of secrecy in regard to the new Greek text being used, and they met in silence for 10 years. And the corrupt Greek text of Westcott and Hort was not released to the public until just five days before the debut of the revised version. This prevented Bible-believing scholars like Dean Bergon from reviewing and exposing it. Now, that background on Westcott and Hort. Now, let's see the difference uh, in the um, environment of the translating of the King James. Can I slide it down just a little more? Are you, are you caught up with me? Pardon me? Secrecy, I'm sorry, yeah. Now, I have to comment here, not to embarrass her, but I found, when I went back to school uh, <clears throat> later in life, that those who sat near the front in the middle usually did the best. 
And so guess where Mrs. Edmonds sits um, during this series, though the rest of the time she's, she's back further. So hint, hint, maybe next time you'll, you'll just take advantage of, of the empty seats and, and you'll get a better view. Not critical of anybody, just experience speaking there. All right, translating the King James Bible. Unlike Westcott, Hort, and the Revised Version Committee, King James went through great efforts to guard the 1611 from translate, uh, uh, translation from errors. Please note the following. One, in 1604, King James announced the 54 Hebrew and Greek scholars had been appointed to translate a new Bible for English-speaking people. The number was reduced to 47 by the time the work formally began in 1607. Rather than working together all at one location, these men were divided into six separate groups which worked at three separate locations. There were two at Westminster, two at Oxford, and two at Cambridge. Each group translated a selected portion of scripture and each scholar made his translation of a book and then passed it on to be reviewed by each member of his group. <coughs> now we're going to notice as we go through this that he actually had individuals of different theological persuasions involved in this. And uh, you say, well, that sounds strange. Uh, that'd be like different denominations of Protestantism working on it. Well, here's, here's the, the genius of that. And I believe the Lord m moved on his thinking to cause him to take this approach. You see, that way, no particular individual could sneak in his denomination's pet understanding, pet translation. It was always checked by somebody else and back and forth and around th a circuit through these committees so that it had to be the purest, most direct, most literal translation it could be in order for everybody to be satisfied. That's, that's a, a real testimony to the reliability and, and accuracy of the finished product. Everybody ready for me to go to another sheet? The whole group then went over the book together. Once a group had completed a book of the Bible, they sent it to be reviewed by the other five groups. Look at all the different angles this was considered by. All objectionable and questionable, tr questionable translating was marked and noted, and then it was returned to, to the original group for consideration. This is a checks and balances system, the way our own government is supposed to work. Notice I said supposed to. A special committee was formed by selecting one leader from each group. This committee worked out all of the remaining differences and produced a finished copy. This means that the King James Bible had to pass at least 14 examinations before going to press. Throughout this process, any learned individuals of the land and see, this is, this is public, this is open, this isn't secret. Any learned individuals of the land could be called upon for their judgment, and the churches were kept informed of the progress. Totally different background between the Westcott Hort text and the majority text that was produced by these fellows from which we get our King James Bibles. All right, let's compare Bibles. 
In this section, we have reprinted... I remember I said that this section was an edited version of some work produced by another fella. He produced this other um, uh, piece that he references here. In this section, we have reprinted our Let's Compare Bibles tract. <coughs> Here you will see several good examples of how modern Bible versions attack God's Word. We have selected eight modern translations for evaluation. The translations evaluated are as follows. This is what they stand for. New International Version, New American Standard Bible, New Revised Standard Version. They had a Revised Standard Version, but it started to lose its market share, so they had to give it some new life. <coughs> Revised English Bible, Living Bible, New World Translation used by Jehovah's Witnesses. Now they find, they, they campaign uh, in, uh, among ignorant Baptists about how the King James is, is so full of flaws. It, it's, we've already talked about the italicized words and, and those things. Um, the honesty of the King James Bible but if you learn anything about the New World Translation, it is the most willfully deceitful version out there, in my opinion. New American Bible and this deceitfully named New King James Bible, New King James Version, um, which we're going to see is not a King James Version at all. It doesn't even come from the same uh, uh, text that the KJV comes from. That's like um, uh, revising Mary Had a Little Lamb with Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star and, and calling it by the same name. It just doesn't work. It's not honest. Ah. Although we have limited this study to eight new translations, you will find some of these attacks manifested in any new translation. You'll find that some of the most important doctrines of the Bible are being attacked in the new versions. Whether you have a Living Bible, a New Century Version, a Revised Standard Version, a Holman Christian Standard Version, <coughs> or any of the other perversions of Scripture, you're going to see the devil hard at work on the revision committees of the new translations. The King James reading will appear first, followed by a brief comment, and then the perverted readings of the modern perversions. Psalm 12, 6, and 7 again. We referred to those a few moments ago. Remember that God has promised to pre preserve His words. And for those of you who weren't here in the early sessions of, of this third section, we saw in Acts chapter 2 that God is able to preserve His word, His words, even through what would for us be the, what's called the barrier of translation. Uh, all of these uh, individuals from all these different countries heard the message in their own language. And, and so God, straight from God in these other languages, the same message, everybody got it. All right. The above promise from the King James Bible tells us that God intends to preserve His words forever. Notice how the new versions destroy this promise by making you think the context is God's people rather than His words. Instead of saying, um, uh, well, you can, you're intelligent, you can see it. You will keep us safe. Thou wilt preserve Him. You, O Lord, will protect us. You are our protector. You will forever preserve your own. You, O oh Lord, will keep us. Now, does the Lord protect and preserve us? Yes, He does. But that's not what this verse is talking about. It's talking about His words. That's kind of quiet. Isaiah 7:14. Therefore, the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. 
Notice how some new versions attack the virgin birth of Christ by robbing Mary of her virginity. As anyone well knows, a young woman or a maiden, as it, it generally appears in these other versions, is not necessarily a virgin. See the difference? See the difference? And that's critical. That's absolutely critical. Okay, we've had so much fun, we've used up our time. So next time, in case I forget, remind me, we're starting on page 45. The next page up. Ah. Now just before we finish, let's go through those books of the Bible. Come on, help me out. My voice is going. You can tell that it is. All right, let's try it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Amen. Brother Dana, would you close this, please? <laughs>